So I'm imagining that there are some kids who are watching us, and so kids, this is your moment. Have you ever been so scared by a storm at night, sometimes maybe when the thunder just really booms so loud that it shakes the house, and then the lightning crackles? Have you ever really been so scared that you had to run to somebody? Most kids I know have been really scared at one time or another by a storm like that. And most of the kids that I know end up in their parents' bedroom. They need someone to just hold them, someone that makes them feel safe and secure, and mommy and daddy are really good about doing that. Well, what happens when there's a really bad storm and mommy and daddy get scared? You know, moms and dads get scared sometimes too. There can be some pretty, pretty bad storms. There can be hurricanes and there can be tornadoes coming and really, really bad storms. And grown-ups have to run to somebody too. The person they run to is the same person that the disciples ran to one time when they were on a boat. They were on the Sea of Galilee and there was a huge storm with lots of rain and wind and the water was coming into the boat. And you know when water comes into a boat, it sinks. Well, they were really getting scared. Jesus was in the boat with them and Jesus was in the back of the boat on a cushion, sound asleep, just sleeping right through that storm. And the disciples ran to him and they said, don't you care that we're about to die from this storm? Well, Jesus did care. The deal was he was asleep because he knew that God was going to keep them all safe. But Jesus saw how scared the disciples were. And so he stood up in the back of the boat and he shouted real loud at the storm, peace, be still. And the wind and the waves Calm down. When the disciples were scared, they knew they could run to Jesus and Jesus would make them feel safe. Everybody, grown-ups as well as children, can run to Jesus when we are scared and say, make me know it's going to be okay, that we're going to come through this and we're going to be okay may not stop the storm right away, but Jesus has a way of making us know that as long as Jesus is around, it's going to be okay. Let's have a prayer together. Lord Jesus, thank you that when we are scared, we can say a short prayer to you. Maybe it's only help. But when we call your name, Jesus, help. We know that you will be there, and we know that you will make us feel safe because you are there. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.
Thank you, pickup choir. I don't know when the next pickup choir is going to be, but we clearly appreciate having one on Sunday morning. Let's pray together. Lord, this is your world and we are your people. We need you to open the eyes of our spirits and open our ears that we may indeed see you and that we may hear your message. So by the power of your Holy Spirit, open us to hear what you would have each of us to hear this day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. There have been a lot of storms lately, atmospheric storms, personal storms, family storms, physical health storms, to name just a few. It's probably safe to say that when a storm of any kind strikes, our only thought is staying safe until it's over, and we want it over now. The passage for today's sermon is the very familiar one about how Jesus calmed the storm on the sea. We've all heard sermons, and I've preached sermons about this passage before, talking about how Jesus calms the storms of life. And those thoughts remain true. But there's more meaning in this event than just Jesus standing up and shouting peace to make the storm stop. And is, is so often the case, context is everything. Before Jesus climbed into that boat with his disciples and set out across the Sea of Galilee, which is known to be treacherous that time of day for its fierce and sudden storms, he had told many disciples a couple of parables one about the man who planted seeds, and while he slept, the seeds sprouted and grew and began producing fruit. And the second about a tiny mustard seed that grew to become the largest plant in the garden. The parables describe the kingdom of God. The seed is like spirit life when it is planted in the rich soil of faith and it grows. Given the presence of Nicodemus at Calvary and his working with Joseph of Arimathea to acquire Jesus' body to prepare it for burial, we can conclude that such growth did take place in Nicodemus following that very special tutoring session that was the sermon text for last Sunday. Immediately following the telling of these parables about the kingdom of God and faith, Jesus got into a boat with the disciples and headed out to sea. The sermon text is Mark 4, verses 35 through 41. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him up and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet! Be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. 
he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. This is the word of the Lord. It is interesting that Jesus headed out on this particular sea, which was well known to be treacherous, right after he had taught those two parables about the kingdom of God, the seeds of life, and faith. There must be a connection. Life is not a collection of disconnected little episodes that have meaning only in and of themselves. Life events are connected, not just in terms of continuity and time, but also in terms of contiguity and meaning. What happened yesterday contributes to the meaning of today, and the collection of day-to-day meanings points to the meaning of our lives. Events, challenges, trials, and the way we get through them are not only tied to our physical and psychological growth, but they're also tied to our spiritual growth and maturing. Knowing that Jesus especially needed the spirit life of these disciples to increase points to the meaningful connection between what he had just taught and the storm experience. So to begin wrestling with the meaning, what it might be, think of how that experience on the sea might tie in with seeds growing, maturing, and producing fruit. It's early summer. Many of us have put seeds in the ground, and if you put plants in the ground, that's okay. Same thing applies. Once you have put the seed in soil, soil which hopefully you have carefully prepared so that it will nourish and nurture the seed, what else is needed? Rain and sunshine, right? The seed sprouts, putting out roots that acquire and transport food to the plant. The roots also stabilize that little plant. As the soil near the surface dries, the roots have to go deeper to seek water. At the right time in the life of the plant, research is showing that exposure to wind strengthens the roots. Of course, we can't know for sure, but it seems reasonable to assume that Jesus knew what was going to happen on the Sea of Galilee when they set out to cross the sea in that boat. Most likely, he knew that a storm would come up and that it would have a favorable impact on the disciples in that boat with him. He slept not because he wasn't concerned about their safety, but because he knew all would be well. The storm was to have a life-building effect, not a destructive effect. On them. So did it. It was as true in their day as it is in ours that we get the message or the meaning of most any experience, but especially a storm experience, as we reflect on it after the fact. 
In reality, some atmospheric storms are destructive, but I think we need to ask ourselves what the meaning is spiritually of storms even as bad as Hurricane Katrina, for example. Interviews of some of the survivors of Hurricane Katrina, both those who lost everything and those who lost very little, have shown that many people increased faith and spiritual life as a result of that storm. So what does all this tell us about any benefits we might derive from storms? Perhaps the first thing we might want to consider is that becoming aware of benefits comes only after the fact, as we reflect on the experience once it's all over and we are safe. While some benefits can come during the storm, most of the time we are too busy keeping our heads above water to have time to step back from the situation and contemplate what might be happening on us on the inside. That is exactly what the disciples on the boat in the Sea of Galilee did. The last verse of Mark 4 says, they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. So what changed for these men? What about each man was different. Had they become better educated? Had they learned more about how to navigate in stormy seas? Had they become less timid in the face of frightening events? Were they recognizing within themselves greater physical strength because they had survived that storm? Well, the answer to all those questions is no. Their first thought was of Jesus and exactly who he is. Who is Jesus? That is the question of faith and spiritual life, is it not? How would you go about answering that question. When you look at your life and become aware that you have survived some pretty significant storms yourself, and you survived only because Jesus was there with you, giving you strength well beyond your own human strength, how do you begin to answer the question of who exactly Jesus is. As Peter, James, John, and the rest of the men in that boat can tell you, you can't find it in a book, not in the Hebrew Bible and not in any of the books of what we now call the New Testament. And Nicodemus would be very quick to tell you that you can't figure it out using cognitive reasoning alone. You can't figure out who Jesus is using deductive or inductive reasoning. You can learn a lot about Jesus through all of those ways, but you can't really learn who Jesus is and all that that means. One thing you could do is to go and ask Jesus. Ask Jesus who he is. The answer would likely not be very satisfying. That's why Jesus did not want his disciples going around telling people that he was the Messiah. You know that little seed that was planted inside you? the seed that was planted 
in well-prepared soil of faith. That's how you get to know who Jesus really is. When the Holy Spirit planted that seed inside of you, you received a little piece of Christ inside you. After the storm, what happened to that seed? Has it sprouted? Now is there an awareness of spiritual life that you didn't have before the experience? Have the spirit roots grown deeper? Has the soil of faith become richer? What do you know about Jesus that you did not know before the storm? Has that little seed not only sprouted, but produced fruit? Think of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Remember, seeds do not produce fruit for their own nourishment. The fruit is always for another. Jesus apparently knew that it was time for his disciples to experience that storm on the sea for their faith to grow. He did not allow the storm to destroy them. That's not the reason God sends storms into our lives. The storm helped to increase their spirit life, and to make their attachment to Jesus grow stronger. So let it be in our lives. Amen. to stand and say what we believe using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our next hymn is Martin Luther's famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress, and if there was ever a person who knew about the storms of life, it was Martin Luther. And this is a testimony to how those storms impacted his faith and the life of his spirit.
You may be seated. And Suzanne Santoro has some presentations to make. First of all, we have a special gift for Hannah. This is to help you with the scholarship. It was given on behalf of our session and um, to help you with school. And I guess you probably can't say much about what you're going to the University of Colorado. Is it okay to say that? And we just wanted to give you this in our appreciation for all you've done. And Help you on your way. You're welcome. On behalf of the whole church, really, we just want to say thank you. I can't give anybody a hug, and I really feel bad I can't do that because I'm feeling very emotional. Um, this is for you on behalf of your retirement from the nursery. Um, so many of our children and grandchildren have grown up with you. It's, I mean, Melody's 21, so it's probably almost that long. Yeah. And we just want to say thank you. And you've been such a blessing to our little ones and to our parents as well. Thank you and God bless. Thank you. We thank Hannah for worshiping with us since you have been in town. I have said before, and I will say publicly, I wish you were going to school in Massachusetts, somewhere close by. We would enjoy your continuing presence with us. And Tanya has just been the one that we've all depended on for child care for a long time. She is truly the child care expert. So we give our thanks and appreciation to both. <laughs> 